One of the most inspirational people of all time for me was William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was a politician who lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and as a young man he became a Christian. Initially he thought that his conversion to Christianity should perhaps mean retirement from public life altogether and a life of solitude. However, after a little thought and persuasion from his friends, he rightly decided that the principles of Christianity should lead not just to meditation and prayer, but also to action, and from that point onwards he spent his life using his position and resources to achieve two main goals, goals that he felt that God himself had set before him. The first goal, for which he is most famous, was the abolition of the slave trade. The second goal was the reformation of morals in society. Wilberforce's society looked a lot like ours. It was on a downward moral curve. It was the post-enlightenment period where Christianity was stigmatized and people who adhered too enthusiastically to their faith were seen as irrational fanatics. It wasn't considered reasonable to bring Jesus up in polite conversation and even those who went to church were nominal Anglicans at best. As might be expected, with God being shunned from public life, the general welfare of society was disintegrating. Immorality was running rampant around the country, brothels had become acceptable and indeed quite fashionable and it had started to lead towards paedophilia with girls of 12 and 13 being dragged into that system. Drunkenness was so out of control that violence and riots on the streets were a common occurrence. Criminals carried out their deeds shamelessly in broad daylight and official reports in 1796 revealed that the people of London were engaging in a shocking list of depraved acts. In fact, it was estimated that about one-eighth of all citizens in London at that time were supporting themselves through illegal activity, from prostitution to thieving to embezzlement to fraud. As I said, it looked a lot like today. It was a society that had shunned its moral compass and the entropy of sin was turning the whole thing into chaos. Wilberforce rightly believed that the only way to improve society was to give God back his place. He said, to the decline of religion and morality our national difficulties must both directly and indirectly be chiefly ascribed, and my only solid hopes for the well-being of my country depend not so much on our fleets and armies, not so much on the wisdom of her rulers or the spirit of her people, as on the persuasion that she still contains many who love and obey the gospel of Christ, that their intercessions may yet prevail, that for the sake of these heaven may still look upon us with an eye of favour. In other words, the hope for the nation was in God, not in man. He also said, If a principle of true religion should gain ground, there is no estimating the effects on public morals and the consequent influence on our political welfare. Wilberforce saw that people needed internal renovation, so again he said, It is only by educating our people in Christian principles that we can advance in strength, greatness and happiness. Wilberforce recognised, as we all should, that if society was to change for the better it needed God, and that Christians were the only ones who could give them God by turning their faith into action. For Wilberforce, that meant campaigning, preaching, signing petitions, lobbying, handing out tracts and pamphlets, and raising public awareness in any way possible. In Amazing Grace, the movie that depicts Wilberforce's story, he says, We are talking about the truth. So we should hand it out to people, drop it from church roofs, paint pictures of it, write songs about it, make pies out of it. In other words, use every gift, talent, resource, opportunity and specialist knowledge we have to get the truth out there into the public realm. What I describe in Know Your Enemy as fighting the information war. In order to do this effectively, he set up many societies. These societies, in effect, were small groups or specialist platoons made up of people with complementary skills, passions and resources. They worked together to bring the gospel into various targeted areas of public life. As recorded in Wilberforce's biography by William Hague, he believed that using Christianity to reform the moral framework of the country was the ultimate issue. If carried out successfully, it would make more of a difference to daily lives and save more souls than any number of well-intentioned acts of parliament. And so, 
He and the people around him set up the Society for the Suppression of Vice, the Church Mission Society, the Proclamation Society, the Bible Society, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Small Debt Society, the Abolition Society, the Anti-Slavery Society, the Sunday School Society, the Bettering Society, and many, many more. Each of these societies targeted a specific social problem or were designed to spread the gospel in some new way. And in order to raise awareness of their causes, they wrote books, tracts, pamphlets, campaigned, lobbied, and generally did anything necessary to get their message out. They fought the information war. They made sure the gospel was heard. A great movement began to get the message out in creative ways. Wilberforce himself wrote a book called Practical Christianity, challenging Christians of the day to turn their faith into action, believing all Christians should use their time to find some ignorance to instruct, some wrong to redress, some want to supply, some misery to alleviate. He was simply calling for people to put the law of Christ into effect by loving God and others in practical and positive ways and doing it in Jesus' name. The group of people around Wilberforce that formed the engine of the movement are today known as the Clapham sect, but in their time they were mockingly referred to as the Saints. As usual, the world didn't particularly like this group of Christians who were making everyone else look bad, bothering their consciences and fighting to raise the moral standards of the day, and so they received much opposition and ridicule. Yet when I read of them, I see the best representation of a true Christian community that has been committed to history outside of the Book of Acts. In fact, although I call this the Wilberforce method, it could just as easily be called the Book of Acts method. Historian Stephen Tompkins describes the Clapham sect as a network of friends and families in England with William Wilberforce as its centre of gravity, who were powerfully bound together by their shared moral and spiritual values, by their religious mission and social activism, by their love for each other and by marriage. William Hague, in his biography of Wilberforce, describes how the saints lived within close proximity to one another and how they would be constantly engaged in strategic planning and practical application of the Word of God. He says, the saints were an informal community characterized by considerable intimacy as well as commitment to practical Christianity and an opposition to slavery. They developed a relaxed family atmosphere, wandering freely in and out of each other's homes and gardens and discussing the many religious, social and political topics that engaged them. We see that same kind of informal, extended family type atmosphere where believers meet every day, sharing their lives together in the biblical descriptions of the early church. I believe it's what true Christian community looks like. What they effectively created was a church that didn't just meet and pray together, but which put faith into action together. They had a mission and they worked at it. Because of their tireless efforts, they did indeed change the country and by consequence, the world beyond. Tompkins says, the ethos of Clapham became the spirit of the age. Indeed, it is reckoned that, along with the great preachers of the day, they were the ones responsible for the raised spiritual climate which would echo right down into the Victorian era. They did indeed change society for the better. That period from Wilberforce's time to the end of the Victorian era is also noted for its vast social and economic improvements in Britain. The country became healthier, more prosperous and militarily more powerful during that time. In fact, it became so powerful that it rose to become the strongest nation on earth with the largest geographical empire in world history. Things improve with God, they decline without him. And it's as simple as that. These saints who were mocked in their time primarily reformed the morals of society by putting God back in the hearts of the men and women who had forgotten him and left the world a better place for it. This is the potential of a small group of Christians who are just willing to put faith into action and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Margaret Mead famously said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And she is right, just ask the twelve disciples. The reason that I personally find Wilberforce and the saints so inspirational is because this method is the vision for the fuel project and was long before I'd heard of the Clapham sect. The goal was and still is to have a network of small group communities all over the world who contain people with unique gifts, talents, passions and resources. These groups would develop a deep closeness as they eat together, pray together, study together and act together. 
They would be independent of one another, but connected to one another as part of a worldwide movement. They would be able to freely share ideas and find one another in various locations for fellowship. The groups would have their own leaders who would make disciples, who would then make disciples, who would then make disciples, and the group would multiply. What the early church did in Acts, what Wilberforce and the Clapham sect did 300 years ago, can be done today, and it's incredibly worthwhile trying to do. And that's where you come in. Right now, we just need funds to produce the next series, but if all goes to plan, the Fuel Project will eventually need passionate, committed Christians who are ready to step outside their comfort zones and be a part of this mobilization effort wherever you live. The world needs the freedom that only Jesus can bring. Now let us go, just as Jesus commanded, and be the ones to give it to them.